are to be put in place to maintain stability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My Lords, I have a lot of sympathy with the furious frustration expressed today at being asked to grant an executive a licence to legislate on thousands of legal instruments, all without accountability to Parliament or the public. I empathise because that anger at a democratic deficit was exactly what prompted me to vote to leave the EU. These very EU retained laws started life as second legislative legislation in positions on the UK Parliament. Directions, uh, um, directives from and obligations to the EU executive. They were a product of a supranational institution whose very design is to ring fence um, swathes of lawmaking from national electorates and to delegate sovereign powers to unaccountable European commissioners, the European Bank, etc. Don't get me wrong, there are problems with this bill. The government may have missed an opportunity to use the retained law issue as a spur for democratic renewal. They could have launched nationwide town hall meetings and debates to guide decisions on what laws to keep or delete. But to note, whatever the anti-democratic dangers of this skeleton bill, there is a popular mandate behind the bill's intent to fulfil the promise of taking back control on our legal, of our legal system by abolishing EU supremacy. We do indeed need to give domestic courts more discretion to depart from retained EU case law. They can take it into account, but should not be required to follow it. Also, the real constitutional outrage before us is not the bill so much as the fact that some domestic primary legislation remains subordinate to EU law. I am not sure complaints that the sunset clause means changes are rushed will cut it with the public. For many millions who voted to leave in the largest democratic vote in UK history, the impression is of sloth, prevarication and obstruction. They deserve a sense of urgency to finish what voters started in 2016. Many of the core objections we've heard today seem to be driven by a failure of imagination. My Lords have cited professional bodies, NGOs, employers organisations, trade union leaders, lawyers, all who appear unable to imagine social and economic progress happening without retained EU laws. Nowhere is this more gallingly illustrated than in accusations that the bill will create a bonfire of workers' rights. Isn't this legalistic presumption insulting to decades of self-organisation by working class people who fought tooth and nail to win those gains? Maybe tell the RMT rank and farm members, many of whom I campaigned alongside for Brexit, that their rights are safer in EU retained law than on their picket lines. Do I trust the Tory government with workers' rights? Of course not. But I don't trust EU law either. The first time I heard the model strike-breaking legisl legislation in the form of minimum service requirements was when it was being eulogised in the European Parliament. And yes, I will be opposing it when it comes to this House. The TUC briefing warns that this bill jeopardises agency workers' directive. But we might note that that very directive is a device used to avoid paying agency staff at the same rate as employed staff. It has been used by the ECJ to break collective bargaining agreements via the 2007 rulings on the Vickery Ferry Company and Levant cases. Other briefings warn us this bill will drive a wrecking ball through women's employment rights and equality legislation. Actually, a far greater threat to equality law in 2023 is not this bill, but the Scottish Government's Gender Recognition Act. How disappointing that all those condemning this so-called dodgy legislation today have not been clamouring to oppose this material assault on women's sex-based rights that threatens the UK-wide Equality Act. The 4,000 retained EU laws were put on the UK statute books without members of this unelected House crying democracy. Earlier we were assured that it was all OK because, as one noble lord explained, there were special behind-closed-door committees that scrutinised them. No mind that no matter how many British voters might object to any one of those laws, there was nothing zilch they could do. The lack of outrage at that democratic deficit Time limit. Perhaps you could bring her comments to an end. <laughs> <laughs> My Lords, it's a great pleasure to welcome Baroness O'Grady and 